Hey folks, Michael May with Michael Man Security Services. Welcome to providing close protection in faith-based environments. This is part four, conducting the threat assessment. Uh, the threat assessment is a very port, important part of providing physical protection and close protection in your church or house of worship. Uh, and so that is what we're going to cover here in the next 10 minutes. Real quick, before we get started, to learn uh, how to do or apply all of these skills, we are teaching a two-day class, July 30th and 31st here in Brentwood, providing close protection in faith-based environments. We will be going over the history of the bodyguard concept of close protection, providing security in faith-based environments, the five principles of close protection, equipment that you need to do this, preemptive care, uh, surveillance detection in faith-based environments, conducting a security survey for your house of worship, which is a big part of close protection, behavior-based threat assessments, the use of force and deployment of firearms, and of course, escort formations for those of you that may be providing close protection services um, for faith-based leaders, okay? All right, so let's get into it. What is the threat assessment? The threat assessment itself is a process for evaluating and verifying perceived threats, including assessing their likelihood. And we talk about perceived threats, what we're talking about here is the threat assessment helps us uh, develop our threat spectrum, or in the government world, we call that a design basis threat. And so the purpose of uh, addressing or assessing this likelihood is putting the pieces together and telling our faith-based environment or our house of worship, look, this is what we believe based on this assessment. This is what we believe we're trying to protect you, the congregants, and the church from. Okay. Now, threat in this case, uh, and that is likelihood, is part of the overall risk equation. Risk is um, uh, the, uh, when we get into faith-based environments or even when we talk about other facilities, it is uh, our churches or houses, our house of worships exposure to a very uh, specific hazard. And so threat being the likelihood of this uh, specific incident or whatever incidents involved in our threat spectrum it is the likelihood or the probability of those events occurring. Now, there are two other pieces to risk, okay? There is vulnerability or a system weakness and the consequence. The vulnerability is something we normally are not doing. That vulnerability is the likelihood or probability that the attack, in this case, will be successful. So the threat is the likelihood or probability of the attack the vulnerability is the likelihood or probability that the attack is going to be successful. And again, that's because of something we're not doing or because of a system weakness. And the consequence is the actual impact of that attack. So the threat piece, again, is the likelihood or the probability that this attack will happen. And it provides us with that threat spectrum or that design basis threat, which builds upon our budget. It builds upon our needs for personnel. It uh, builds upon our needs for training, and it's, it also justifies all of those factors, okay? So the threat assessment is very, very important. Now, the reason why we want to do a threat assessment for you protectors out there, uh, whether you're doing close protection or just basic protective services, one, uh, it shows that we are being good stewards of our resources. So if we're able to show where our threat is to that faith-based environment, to that house of worship, it shows that we are being good stewards, right? We're not wasting anything. Two, without the threat assessment, we might overreact. And not just from a, not just from a physical standpoint, but we may be doing too many things, which also might conflict with the mission of the organization we're protecting, and in this case, is a church. Physically overacting, which we talked about uh, two weeks ago before the holiday, can create, a, can create a liability issue if we do that. And then, of course, also, if we actually show based on the threat assessment that we are being good stewards, then our future resources obviously can continue. Uh, but then again, if we don't do a threat assessment, we overreact, then and the church finds out about it, then our future resources could be limited or they could take so resources from us. So this is why we want to conduct that threat assessment, why the threat assessment is important in both close protection and providing just basic protective services. Now, some of you folks that have seen a lot of our stuff, you've paid attention to us. Uh, this is a case study on why you need a threat assessment. This is an attack that actually happened on a ministry. It's not a church, but it's still a ministry. Some of you guys and, uh, and ladies 
could be doing close protection and conducting protective services for other ministries outside of like a church. Maybe it's not a church or house of worship. It could be a camp. Uh, it could be a faith-based business or uh, some sort of a business has a faith-based mission. So this is an important um, case study to show why threat assessment is, uh, is, is needed. So this is the attack on the Family Research Council FRC in 2012. And so if we go back to 2012 and think about some of the things that were happening back then, uh, there were uh, several groups uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people that were trying uh, at a reversal of a constitutional amendment to define marriage. Okay? Uh, there were uh, obviously, uh, for, uh, you know, for the right reasons, there were a lot of ministries, there were churches, uh, Christians in general, that took a public stance against uh, this potential reversal in the Family Research Council, because that's their job, took a very public stance against that. Now, when they did that, uh, what happens as we, you know, as we stand up for our faith and we go against the world, what that does is that increases the likelihood of a very specific threat, in this case, an attack. Um, now, I know the director of the uh, current security director for FRC, and he told me uh, uh, information about this attack. I met him about two years ago at a Southern Baptist uh, event uh, here in downtown Nashville. Uh, he was providing protection uh, for the director of time, and I was there also providing protective services uh, with another, uh, with a good friend of mine who uh, is a, a full-time security director of the location where this, where uh, we met this gentleman. And he kind of, he let me in on this attack. I'd read about the attack before and had used it in some of our case studies, but got a little bit more insider information on it. So here's what happened. So there's this uh, push to reverse this constitutional amendment on the definition of marriage. All right. FRC comes out and stands against it, uh, which uh, rightfully so. And this increases the likelihood of an attack from someone or from a threat uh, that obviously stands in opposition to what uh, FRC stands in its stance is in our faith, right? And so uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Floyd Lee Corkins, who is an adv advocate for gay marriage. Um, for what I understand, uh, was involved in, uh, you know, as a volunteer in uh, uh, several uh, gay groups and was, again, advocate for gay marriage. And um, in 2012, sees all this happening, sees, uh, you know, some of the country uh, fighting for gay marriage. And then you have these factions, uh, Christian organizations fighting against it. He decides he wants to attack someone that stands against this. So he starts to plan the type of attack in early August of 2012. So at first he thinks, uh, well, he doesn't exactly know who the target's going to be, but he's thinking in his mind, right? Because really an event will happen twice. What happens in the mind first, and then actually the uh, follow through on the attack will occur. And so in his mind, he's thinking through what kind of attack. Uh, according to my research, the first uh, part of this, the first plan was to conduct some sort of an explosive attack. He realized uh, pretty quickly that that probably was the best attack uh, to conduct. It was complicated, and he could also get hurt if it wasn't done correctly. And so that he decides to conduct an armed attack, even though he knows nothing about weapons. He's never done this. So on August 7th, uh, Corkins gets online. He starts shopping for handguns. He finds a gun store that is uh, located, I think, within driving distance to his house. Um, on the 9th, he travels to the gun store to select the weapon after calling them and talking to them on the phone about different types of handguns. Uh, on the 7th or 8th, uh, when he actually contacted them, they actually told him that, look, if he comes down and buys this weapon from them, that they'll also give him two free hours of training to learn how to use the weapon because he, he told them he had no experience with weapons. And so he goes down on August the 9th and travels to the gun store to select this weapon. So again, think about this process. There's this push to reverse uh, this constitutional amendment. The FRC takes a public stance. Corkins at this time, he's watching the news. He decides he wants to fight for this uh, reversal, and he is going to uh, actively attack, physically attack uh, anyone that stands in his way uh, to, to do this. And so um, he starts looking for what kind of attack, and again, he decides it's going to be an attack with a, with a, with a firearm. And so on the night, he travels down to this gun store to select the weapon. On the 10th, um, he actually goes on the 9th, looks at it. They talk to him and tell him what he needs. On the 10th, he actually goes back to the gun store. He purchases the weapon. On August the 12th, he starts to conduct online research to identify the target or targets he is going to attack 
that stand in his way of these things that he believes. Um, he does actually uh, pick FRC. He does this because he gets on a website, uh, um, uh, kind of a left war. It is a left wing website, and uh, he picks FRC, and he also picks two other uh, uh, ministries to attack. I I don't know, and in, in the research I conducted, I could not find who those other two ministries were. Um, so he conducts remote hostile surveillance actually on FRC. So online, he starts gathering information about the Family Resource Council. On the 13th, he actually travels down. So in his remote hostile surveillance, finds uh, gets uh, adversary path or finds the path down there, uh, gets on the uh, metro from what I understand, and actually takes uh, get, goes down to FRC. So on the 13th, he goes down to FRC. Uh, what he is able to do, so when we talk about vulnerability, right, we talk about system weaknesses, those things that increase the potential or the probability of the attack being successful. There are two types. There are, one, there are those exploitable vulnerabilities. So uh, in some sort of a system weakness, we're able to go around or exploit it. And there's also those observable weaknesses, those things that we see like a hole in the fence or maybe a door being unlocked. What he does find is that FRC is secure. There's a lock on the door. You can't just open the door. You push a button, it, it, it buzzes into a security person, with, and there's a camera there, and uh, you, have to get, uh, you have to gain it minutes into FRC. Um, if I remember correctly, the first time he says that he is there uh, to see someone uh, that actually I think didn't work there, he, he actually finds this weakness or he sees it, he, he actually uh, discovers it because the security guard lets him in to try to determine exactly what he's looking for. So he actually gets inside the target area, Corkins does. So an exploitable vulnerability, right? So uh, kind of a bad access control policy, even though the building's locked down. So uh, which increases the probability of this attack. So he gets in while he's in there, kind of looks around, gets a, gets a lay of the land, right? He's looking uh, very specifically for the target area, what his avenues of approach going to be, and he has determined how to exploit a very specific vulnerability. So the probability of this attack is, is now increased, okay? On August the 14th, he prepares for the attack, um, uh, gets extra ammo, loads it up in his backpack, goes to Chick-fil-A, uh, gets, I think, 15 Chick-fil-A sandwiches. His plan was to shoot everybody inside the target, inside this uh, uh, NS, uh, FRC, and after shooting them, he was going to rub these Chick-fil-A sandwiches in their faces, okay? August the 15th, he packs all of his gear, including the uh, Chick-fil-A sandwiches, in a backpack, he, uh, he goes down uh, to FRC, again, returns this time to conduct the attack. He's going to execute it. And then again, using ruse, he gets inside. So uh, this time, I think he said he was there for some sort of a uh, interview for an internship. And again, security lets him in. So he exploits this vulnerability. So he's able to get into the target area to conduct this attack. Uh, once he's in this time, the uh, security guard, a different security guard this time, figures out that there's not something, something's not right with him. And I'm going to show you the video here in just a second. And uh, as uh, Corkins goes to conduct the attack, gets the backpack or gets the weapon of his backpack, the uh, security guard fights back. The security officer is injured. He is shot in the attack. And, uh, but the guard is able to subdue Corkins and Corkins is uh, subdued. He is arrested. He is charged with terrorism. So here's the video going to walk you through the attack here in just a second. So as the video's uh, starting, so what you're going to see here in just a minute, you're going to see Corkins walk in. He's there at the uh, desk with the security officer. Security officer kind of figures out something's not right, probably figures out he's not there for an internship. Uh, there's some behavioral and contextual indicators here. Uh, and what he does is he fights Corkins. So uh, Leo Johnson has let uh, Corkins in. Again, Corkins said he was there to, I think, interview for some sort of an internship. Uh, as he's talking, you're going to see this bag has, uh, you know, some positive value to Corkins, which means, you know, he, he doesn't want anybody else to get a hold of it. So watch, he's kind of taking control of it. He sets it down so he can get the weapon out. At this point, Leo Johnson figures out that something's probably not right. Whatever that conversation, uh, whatever happened in that conversation, whatever was said, realized probably this is not something that's uh, on the up and up. Um, uh, there, Corkins pulls out the gun. He shoots Leo. Leo continues to wrestle with him. At some point, Leo does get the gun from him. He is able to subdue, subdue Corkins, and then Corkins is arrested, and he is later convicted of, I think, one to two acts of terrorism inside D.C. FRC is uh, located in the District of Columbia there, Washington, D.C. Um, after the arrest, uh, you know, uh, because of the attack and, uh, you know, because of what happens with, during the interview with law enforcement, 
It is determined that Corkins uh, planned this attack. Again, he has convicted, uh, he's charged and convicted with terrorism. So we think about this attack. We think about, again, the threat. Don't know if a threat assessment was done during all this as FRC was very uh, boisterous uh, about what was happening uh, and about what their thoughts were, uh, obviously because of faith. Um, this increased the likelihood of this type of an attack. There were some system weaknesses, obviously, in this case. The uh, adversary was able to exploit those weaknesses, uh, those vulnerabilities, and was able to gain access to the target. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, Mr. Johnson was able to subdue after being shot, subdue the adversary, and stop him from conducting this armed attack and killing everyone inside the FRC. So again, this is a good, great, or a great um, case study uh, for uh, why we need threat assessments done in those protected environments or those environments were protected. Again, we'll learn how to conduct all these skills. You're going to learn how to do that, providing close protection, faith-based environments. Again, July 30th through the 31st here in Brentwood. We're going to go over these concepts, two-day class. Uh, it's going to teach you how to conduct those close protection uh, operations and protect the service operations, whether you're inside the sanctuary, protecting that faith-based leader, you're at some sort of a camp, or you're just out standing post at your house of worship every day, how that is done. And then, of course, it, again, it gets into surveys, equipment, escort formations, all the things you need to do to, to learn how to conduct those uh, close protection ops. Okay. All right. Have any questions? You know how to get a hold of us. Uh, you can uh, let me kind of go back up here. You can go to uh, the website. Uh, you can uh, contact us at michaelmansecurityservices.com uh, or you can get us at Scott M or S C O T T M at michaelmansecurityservices.com or at contact at michaelmansecurityservices.com. And again, you give us a call 615 956. 3912. And of course, you can always get us at Facebook at Safe With Man or on Instagram. All right, folks, we will see you next week. If you have any questions, be sure to get a hold of us. And we hope to see some of you folks on the 30th and the 31st.